All right, this month we are talking about uh, porting from MFC to Wix widgets. Uh, before we started recording these presentations, we did a, a presentation on Wix widgets, but we will just briefly review that here. Since we don't have a recording of that, that's back when we were meeting in person. Wix widgets is a cross-platform GUI cool toolkit and uh, in stark contrast to MFC, or sorry, in stark contrast to Qt, which is also a cross-platform GUI cool toolkit, Wix widgets tries to provide a portability layer around the native desktop GUI toolkit for whatever platform you're on. So with Wix widgets, you program to a single API, but on a Mac, you get a user interface that looks like a standard Mac user interface. On Linux, you get typically a GTK uh, style user interface. On Windows, you get a standard Windows looking user interface. Um, so Wix widgets itself tends to not have a lot of code in the libraries that it provides because it's essentially a thin portability delegating layer around the native windowing system for whatever platform you're building on. Now, there are some pieces of code that are unique to Wix widgets, like their resource uh, management system, the XRC files, which we will look at a little bit later. Uh, so that ends up being an actual library with actual code because it is creating a unified system across platforms uh, in, in a manner that provides some extra functionality that isn't really available on any of the platforms uh, natively that is so um, but most of the time it's a thin delegating ship now user interface as a topic is very deep so here's books that I consulted for this little project as far as I got for the presentation today um, the bottom book there is a really it's like 1100 pages they have they, they cheated by using thin paper and that is how to program to the Windows API from a C perspective so not using any toolkit layer on top you're just programming directly to raw win32 uh, advanced windows I didn't have to consult much of that but he does have a really good chapter on Unicode and how um, that is supported in the Windows API we will see some consequences of that as we look at code uh, obviously you need to know something about MFC in order in order to port an MFC application you have to understand what it's doing before you change it and a book on Wix widgets um, although to be honest Wix widgets has very good online documentation in terms of programming guides and references that are I believe just generated from the source code via Doxygen so strictly speaking I would say you don't need a book on Wix widgets in order to learn Wix widgets uh, effectively do you need a book on MFC to learn MFC effectively uh, I like learning from books, so for me, it was very helpful when I was learning MFC. Um, but again, the MFC documentation is all online now. It used to be that you would only get the MFC documentation and the so source code to MFC if you purchased Visual Studio. However, Visual Studio Community Edition, which is available for free with no restrictions, includes the source code for MFC provided that when you're installing Visual Studio Community Edition you drill down into the little optional components and say yes please install the MFC source code now this can be very handy for understanding what your MFC application is doing when you make a particular method call on a particular class because then you can step into the source code for MFC and see what's going on particularly if you hit some kind of debugging assert having the source code available is going to be very handy um, now, MFC also has programming guides and how-to articles and so on on Microsoft's uh, document website, which is now learn.microsoft.com. However, 
this is a pet peeve I have with Microsoft. They keep reorganizing all their online documentation so all the URLs break. They used to be docs.microsoft.com and before that it was msdn.microsoft.com and I think there was even a point where it was just msdn.com. And because they keep reorganizing things, it's hard to get a stable reference to the information. So for that reason, I, when I was working on this project, I was often just looking things up in the book because the book has an index and I own the book already. So using that book was, you know, in a way, sadly, more convenient than trying to find things with Google on their website. Um, but that's, again, pet peeve I have with Microsoft. So um, what we are talking about is we're going to talk about how to convert from MFC, which is one, let me just make this font a little bigger for you. MFC is one comprehensive GUI toolkit for writing GUI applications on Windows and Windows only. And it has classes that represent the individual controls. A control is some kind of user interface element like a button or a text box or a piece of static text displayed as a label. Those controls are arranged in some kind of hierarchy that represents the layout of the controls on some kind of container window, whether that container window is a dialogue or whether it's a top-level window. Top-level windows being the windows that are children of your desktop. And MFC's been around for a long time, like probably like 35 years. I mean, I think MFC was first introduced in the mid-90s, maybe even late 80s. Let's just check that on Wikipedia. If we go look on Wikipedia and we put in MFC, and it is Microsoft Foundation Class Library. 31 years ago. First release was in 1992. So it's been around a long time. There's lots and lots of applications written for MFC. A lot of open source applications were written with MFC. But since MFC was created, we've gotten cross-platform GUI toolkits like Qt and Wix widgets. Wix widgets is most similar to MFC, so if you're porting an MFC application, Wix widgets is the natural fit. It's not that you can't port to Qt, um, but Qt is different enough that essentially you just be rewriting everything as opposed to uh, doing a port. Now, our goal is to um, change as little of the code as possible and keep things running. Our poster boy application that we're going to be using is a program called Hippie. And this program, you can find it on SourceForge. You got to make there's there's actually two projects on SourceForge called Hippie. You got to make sure you find the right one. Uh, if you want to find the older one, the one that hasn't been edited or touched in 15 years. So it's an old program. We're going to be porting that from MFC to Wix widgets. We're going to be trying to do that incrementally so that we're keeping things working and not trying to change too much code all at once because that's how you get yourself into trouble. This is essentially a, a mega refactoring and with refactoring you always want to keep a working system, make changes in small increments, test your changes and that way you don't get lost and you don't get stuck in a hole and have to discard a whole bunch of work and start over again. But we need to figure out event handling we need to figure out some kind of build because if we're going to be bringing this over to Linux, we can't use Visual Studio solution projects. we got to have some kind of portable build. So we're going to use CMake for that. We're going to get Wix widgets itself through VC package. That will give us a cross-platform way to get Wix widgets libraries as a dependency. Uh, we got to figure out what to do about resources in Win32 and uh, MFC there is a resource script commonly used to do things like you know store strings store dialogue layouts uh, store uh, text that goes onto controls and 
images and icons. Those are all uh, recorded in a resource script. The resource script is compiled into a binary resource file. That resource file is then linked into your application, so it's a big blob of resource data that's in your executable, and Windows has functions for loading data out of that blob. So you can load an image from the resource portion of your executable. You can instantiate a dialog from the resource portion of your executable. The dialog will then contain a bunch of controls. Those controls will get all instantiated. And, it, it, you know, it's a handy system, but it's Windows specific. So you have to find some way to deal with that in a cross-platform manner. Um, this particular application also has plugins. So this application is a assembler and simulator. The assembler is a separate console application, but the simulator is connected to the GUI. And the simulator has a mechanism for loading plugins that represent devices in your microprocessor system. So it comes with two plugins, one that represents your EEPROM that holds the firmware for the system and it has another plugin that represents a LED display with an associated 20 key, I think it's 20 keys, uh, a, a, a keypad as an, so it gives you an IO device, gives you an input device for the keypad and gives you an output device for this LED, simulated LED display. And the idea is that if you were building your own 6800 uh, Motorola 8-bit CPU single board computer or whatever kind of computer using a 6800 you would have these plugins that represent the devices that are mapped into the memory space of the processor and that way your simulator can simulate your entire system and not just the CPU in isolation. Um, it has this program uses what's called a uh, multiple document interface paradigm uh, that's not a popular paradigm anymore. People tend to use, um, if the application is going to maintain multiple windows, the multiple windows are all top-level windows, so they're all children of the desktop as opposed to children of this parent frame. That's the multiple document interface parent frame, and then you have child windows inside that parent frame, and the parent frame is a child of the desktop. It's It's not a popular user interface convention anymore, but that's the way this code is. Um, and uh, as I was working through this, I made a GitHub gist, which is basically just a, a single version controlled file instead of a whole repo. But I made a gist um, with some basic advice, which we'll go over in a second, links to some reference pages and as I was going through this, I basically just wrote down every single little step that I was doing. Uh, and I haven't gotten all the way down here in my sample application yet of bringing everything into Wix widgets from MFC, but did enough of the intermediate uh, stage work to show you the kinds of things that you're going to want to do. So this sample program, or it's not really a sample program, but this poster boy example program that we're using. I have taken the source code from GitHub. I have imported it, sorry, took the source code from SourceForge, imported it into GitHub, and that's where I've been working on uh, the GitHub version. There's also a sample in Wix widgets that shows how to mix. It's in the Wix widgets repository, which is on GitHub, in case you want to see that. It's github.com, Wix widgets, slash Wix widgets, Wix widgets. And this is their whole repository. And if you drill down in here, there's a samples folder. And if we look down in the samples folder, there's an MFC folder. And there's a sample in here that shows you how to mix MFC and Wix widgets together, which is going to be very useful for us for what we're trying to do because as we work on the intermediate stages, we're going to have a combination of Wix widgets controls and MFC controls. We need to make them play nice together. Unfortunately, in the current Wix widgets uh, tree, this sample is not being built. 
Um, there's a comment about turning it off until it builds again, but I didn't have any problem building it. I imported that sample alone into GitHub and uh, brought in Wix widgets through VC package. VC package has a sub module and I made a CMake based build for it and I was able to build and run that sample just fine. So uh, I have a feeling like it, it at some point it wasn't building and they turned it off but it's building now and they just haven't turned it back on yet because they didn't realize it was working again. But let's start at the beginning. Uh, so my I've got some links here to reference information. So the Wix widgets documentation, as I said, is all online. And this uh, top page, you know, has uh, programming guides and list of libraries and overviews of the groups of classes. And if you go up here into these um, top level tabs, you can just go and find all the classes alphabetically. So that serves as your class reference. So their uh, online documentation that is generated from the source code is very good and it's always kept up to date so that's your best bet for reference documentation there are a few pages on the wiki uh, the github wiki so this is their well it's their own hosted wiki because they had a wiki before they were on github so they're, they're using their own hosted wiki it's not a wiki um, implemented through the github wiki uh, feature at any rate um, the wiki is more information that is kind of coagulated together by users because anybody can um, register on here I'm not sure I, I registered a long time ago and I think they must have closed off registration because it was getting hit by spam bots there, there's a login but I didn't find their registration page anymore uh, maybe you have to go on the mailing list and request an account that way if you want to edit the wiki uh, I happen to have one because I created one a long time ago before spam bots were a problem. But over there on the wiki, there's uh, some information about compiling Wix widgets projects using MSVC. Uh, there's some information about um, corresponding classes between MFC and Wix widgets. This is in the form of a script that basically just does search and replace on a bunch of identifiers. Uh, I did not use this script myself because I want to keep my program working and do incremental changes. And if I run this script, it's going to change everything all at once and I'm going to have a thousand and, or, and one compile errors and I have to change everything all at once. So I didn't use this script, but it is useful to know, hey, in MFC, the C font class has corresponding functionality in the WX font class in Wix widgets. So it's it's a good thing to consult to look for uh, corresponding identifiers. For instance, uh, declare message map is how you create the information that wires up messages, uh, which are essentially the events generated in the UI. How you match those up to some kind of handler function. Well, in MFC, you write declare message map to build out a table of mapping events to handlers. The corresponding thing in Wix widgets is declare event table. So it's very, very similar. Um, and it's also quite both. Of the, the QT does not work its event handling in this manner. QT's event handling is, is very different. So that's why I say if you're porting from a Wix widgets application to some you want to go to some portable cross-platform GUI framework Wix widgets is a closer fit than QT um, so it's it's convenient to consult this script to see you know which things in MFC correspond to which things in Wix widgets but there's also a uh, which Wix widgets for MFC programmers page and it discusses uh, some corresponding things. There's a, a, a class table down here. Not every single class in MFC is listed with its corresponding class in Wix widgets. For instance, this uh, 
rich edit control from MFC, which corresponds to the rich text control in Wix widgets. That happens to be a row that I added just earlier today as I was working on things. Uh, it's the advantage of a wiki is anybody can contribute as long as they have an account. Um, and I have a link to that WXMFC sample that I have modified to use a CMake based build and getting Wix widgets itself as a dependency through VC package. But basic advice. Uh, as always with a huge transformation like this, don't get stuck in a ditch changing too many things at once. Try to keep your program running as long as possible with small changes. Um, th there's going to be a certain point where you're going to have to make a big change to get things moved from uh, Wix widgets to, sorry, from MFC to Wix widgets. For instance, uh, usually that's going to be when you switch over your top level window. Um, or when you switch over the, the, the main application class. And you want to try and get as many things as possible switched over inside before you make that so that it's not having to switch everything at once. It's also common for a GUI application to have lots of application logic directly in the event handlers. And this makes things even more difficult because now you're in the process of just trying to change the GUI aspect of the application, but along the way you accidentally break the application's functionality itself. A good way to uh, prepare yourself for the switch and guarantee that your application functionality is going to stay working is to first refactor you know, dialogues or top-level windows using mediator pattern and decouple the application logic from the GUI framework. Now, when we talked about the WinLAM library a few months back, it might be over a year now, I showed an example of how uh, you can wire up controls on a dialogue in such a way that the controls are interacting. Your, you know, I, I believe in, in that particular example, I had a text box, so a text editing field, and there was a button, and the button was disabled if the text field was empty. And as soon as you start typing text into the text field, it enables the button. And if you uh, then, like, you know, delete all the text out of the text field, it disables the button again. So you've got user interface logic coupled to event handling from the controls. Now, uh, we wanted to have that user interface logic to be testable outside of instantiating an actual GUI. So uh, this example three shows how to do it where all the logic is in the event handlers and then this example four shows how to uh, do it have the, the the application logic separated out into a mediator and it in, interacts with the controls on the dialogue through abstract interfaces so in a t unit test situation we can create mocks for the user interface elements so we're not using concrete user interface elements when we test our application logic and um, that's all explained in more detail in uh, this video rating native Win32 applications with WinLAM and modern C++ so if you want to drill into that because you know, you're unfamiliar with mediator pattern it's a really once you see how it works it's a really uh, simple pattern and I did a little bit of decoupling in the example that we're going to code that we're going to look at, but I didn't go all the way towards uh, mediator. I just did a little bit of decoupling so that I could take the application functionality that functionality that was wired up in the MFC control, and I could just copy and paste it into my Wix widgets control, and it was the identical code because it wasn't connected to the GUI framework; it was connected to an abstract interface. All right, so the first thing you need to do is set up your build, and chances are for your MFC project, you don't have a CMake-based build. Um, there's a couple global settings you need to set in order for <coughs> a CMake-based build to work properly. The most important one is this uh, CMake MFC flag, and that says how you're going to consume MFC in 
uh, the targets created by this project. It, it's a global flag. Uh, the value 2 is saying to use MFC from a shared library, so a DLL. In my case, I had code that was so old and crusty that it wasn't setting the version of the Windows API that it was going to consume explicitly. Uh, so uh, this AFX DLL, if you, anytime you see anything AFX, that's an MFC related symbol. So this AFX DLL symbol is saying, you know, when you consume the headers, you're going to be consuming uh, MFC from a shared object from a DLL. And then Win32, WinNT, and WinVer are two symbols that you, I'm not sure if you need both. I found some places that tested WinVer and other places that tested Win32, WinNT. Um, you set these to a value that represents the version of the Windows API that you're going to target. So for instance, if you're, tar if you're targeting Windows 7, I mean this, this code's 15 years old, so it predates Windows 7. Uh, 15 years ago, what, that was probably like Windows XP, maybe, or maybe Windows 2000. But Windows 7 is a comfortable um, baseline for me to target. And the main purpose of setting these is so that if you attempt to call a function from the Win32 API that was introduced in a version of the API after the one that you've chosen, it's a compile error. The APIs are not available to the exposed to the compiler when you include the headers. All the newer functions are bracketed with a version test around these symbols and they're only declared if you've set the, the version to be high enough to include those. Um, if you're starting with an existing project, which you know typically you are, I think this code when I imported it from SourceForge, the the project was so old that I it wouldn't even migrate in Visual Studio 2022. Uh, I, it was either like you know a VC6 project file or something like that, and I just didn't because it wouldn't automatically migrate. I didn't have any project at all, and that's why I had to uh, set up some base things here just to get the code compiling. But if you do have, um, I, I can certainly look at these existing projects <coughs> in a text editor. They're just text files. They're XML. Uh, older files are not, there's a custom format thing. They're not XML, but the newer ones are XML. But you can just examine them in a text editor, to pull out compile flags and so on like that. Th this code didn't have a lot of like custom compilation flags around any of the source files, so I didn't need to consult them too deeply. I just got the basics out of there to find out which targets were um, being compiled from which source files, and I reconstructed those targets in CMake. I strongly recommend that when you're configuring and building with CMake that you create your build directory outside of your source tree. Do this so that the generated CMake project files don't accidentally clobber over project files in your source tree. Uh, just keep all the build generated files outside of your source tree. You'll just it, it, you'll just be much happier that way. Um, that way, you don't get any collision with uh, your existing project files, and you can keep examining them. If something you know goes wrong, it's just not working correctly. Um, there's this M uh, WXMFC sample. Um, that shows how to mix Wix widgets controls inside a top-level window created by MFC and it shows how to mix a top-level Wix widgets window with a top-level MFC window from the same application. Um, we'll look at that in a little bit, but it's just something to keep in mind. Um, you can look at that uh, sample or you can look at Hippie to see how the CMake build is set up. Um, it turns out that in the WXMFC sample that due to the way Wix widgets headers were configured to properly choose the Windows API version, I didn't need to do this uh, add definitions part. Um, you do need to do the CMake MFC flag. Um, the next thing is we're going to need to get Wix widgets as a dependency for our, our CMake build, so the easiest way to do that is to get it from VC package. Um, the most 
reliable way in terms of uh, having a fixed set of de recipes for your dependencies so the, the, the dependencies don't keep shifting on you is to add VC package as a submodule to your git repository and that way you can control which version of the VC package recipes you're consuming um, they're they're gonna stay the same recipe until you update your submodule to a later version of VC package I happen to in my example I've got VC package at I've got VC package down in the source folder and I've got it at this revision which happens to be this 2023.08.09 release so fairly recent uh, it's actually the most recent release of VC package in terms of their tags it's not the head of their master branch but it is the most recent uh, release that's been tagged um, use the CMake toolchain file from your nested VC package to configure CMake using VC package to, to fetch dependencies. Um, the dependencies are going to be listed in your uh, I'm using manifest mode so I'm using a JSON file that specifies which dependencies I have. I've got Wix widgets listed in there so when I configure CMake using that toolchain file from the submodule that I've pulled in it's going to go and s consult my manifest file and pull down the dependencies that are listed in the manifest file build them all locally the first time it pulls them down it'll pull down the source files for the dependencies and then it'll do a build on the source files for the dependencies and the next time you configure and run as long as you haven't you know nuked your build directory it will have cached versions of the source files and cached version of the build outputs so you only pay a cost of fetching and building all your dependencies the first time the source files actually get cached in the submodule directory so you can delete your build directory and it won't refetch the sources for your dependencies but it will of course rebuild them because you just deleted them um, now the next trick is to add WX base this is the lowest layer library in Wix widgets um, when you use these when you use VC package to obtain Wix widgets as a dependency and you call find package on Wix widgets to locate it in the place where VC package puts all the built stuff for the dependencies it creates imported targets for the different libraries and they're all just WX and then whatever the name of the library is is, is the name of the imported targets um, so base this just brings in things like their string class and their array class and stuff like that. It doesn't bring any GUI components in. It's just the uh, the base portability layer of like utility classes and stuff like that. But if we add WX base as a dependency to our targets, the first thing that's going to happen is it's going to force a Unicode build. At least the default on Windows is to build uh, with Unicode. You can of course configure that and change it. Uh, but the default is Unicode. Modern Windows is intrinsically Unicode, so Unicode is the correct default. When you actually reference uh, Windows API functions using the ANSI versions, narrow strings where uh, individual characters are just a care and not a WKRT, what actually happens is Windows takes your narrow string, widens it to Unicode, makes the underlying call into the operating system, takes any return strings that come back as wide strings, narrows those return values to uh, ANSI strings, and then gives you the ANSI string as a result. So Unicode is the correct default for Windows. But my code, being 15 years old that I'm porting, it wasn't written with Unicode in mind. Uh, even though 15 years ago you could have written the code in such a way that it could be compiled for either ANSI like a Windows 95 target or you could compile it for Unicode like a Windows NT target Windows NT was always Unicode by default Windows 95 Windows XP those were ANSI uh, implementation and when you tried to call the Unicode 
uh, implementation on those operating systems. It would do the opposite conversion I just described. It'd take your wide strings, narrow them, pass them into the operating system, get a narrow string out, convert the narrow string back to a wide string, and give it back to you. So until Windows 2000, which kind of unified the consumer line, which previously was ANSI strings, and the commercial line of Windows NT, which was always wide strings, it was common to have a single source base that you would build for a narrow string build or a wide string build. So this code was old. It just kind of assumed narrow strings everywhere. So as soon as I introduced the Unicode dependency, I had a lot of fixing to do. The main thing that you need to do is change use of care to tcare. This is a, this is a Windows uh, specific change we're making here. We're getting things working with Unicode on Windows first before we start switching to Wix widgets strings. Um, the tcare, uh, depending on whether you compile for Unicode or compile for ANSI, is a single type def that is adapted depending on the style of your build. If you're building Unicode, tcare turns into a wcare t. If you're building for ANSI, then tcare turns into just plain care. And there are corresponding tcare style string functions that are similarly if deft to either, you know, this is TCS CPY. So in a Unicode build that turns into WCS CPY, wide character string copy. In an ANSI build, it turns into stir copy, narrow character string copy. So using these T functions and T care and the few places where you need to go in and out of uh, narrow strings or wide strings, you can use these CT2A, which is convert T care to ANSI and convert ANSI to T care. There's also a CT2W if you need to get it. I didn't need to use the converting explicitly to wide strings because uh, mostly I was doing things like I had a call to f open f open only accepts a narrow string so I have to convert t strings to narrow strings or I have a you know std string somewhere I'm reading contents of an ASCII file and so it's more convenient to use um, either f open or to use <clears throat> IF stream for reading, OF stream for writing. Those are narrow, the narrow character stream classes from the standard library. Again, I marshal those narrow strings in and out as uh, to T cares uh, or T strings as they come in and out of these files. Um, <clears throat> there's some documentation in Microsoft's online site, you know, and here I've got, it's a URL out to learn.microsoft.com. It's, you know, I don't know, it might work for a couple of weeks before they change it again. Who knows? But it's working currently. Uh, explain how strings are handled. They call it in Visual C++. It's really not a function of the compiler. It's a function of the Windows SDK and the headers to the Windows API functions, the Win32 functions. Um... Once you've got everything building using Unicode with the MFC Unicode support, this might be a good time to backfill some unit testing onto your application logic if you have if you don't already have unit tests. Because now we're going to start changing things from MFC to Wix widgets. So far we've just been trying to get our build ready for you know modern windows environment for this mfc code we have in my case it's 15 year old code it was last touched in 2006. Uh, so if you don't have unit tests yet and you've got complex application logic now might be a good time to go and think about decoupling that code just enough to be able to write a test for it and cover the existing functionality with tests there's a variety of ways to do that um, there's a kind of a bulk way of doing it using something called um, what do they approval tests if you google approval tests you can find some frameworks there's one for C and C++ code and basically the idea there is 
add a bunch of logging to your code, have it dump out a bunch of the internal state of your application logic as it is processing, and you're going to uh, process the, you know, all, a big chunk of application logic end-to-end. -end. You're going to end up with a very verbose log of the internal state as it's changing as the application is doing its processing. You're going to essentially capture that big log into a file, and then as you keep changing the code, you've got that version-controlled log and you keep running the approval test, generating a new log and comparing it to the old one and making sure that things didn't change. That's the idea of an approval test. Uh, more fine-grained unit testing uh, can also be done using gtest and whatnot, and we'll see a little bit of, of where I've pulled some code out and done that. It basically, just, just some string handling, and I just wanted to make sure that I didn't break it. The next thing you're going to do is add the basic Wix widget header wx slash wx dot h and we can use um, angle bracket notation here because when we did a find package on Wix widgets that added the right include directory to our search path for any target that depends on Wix widgets which we already introduced the dependency by adding uh, WX base as a dependency. So when we did that, CMake for that imported target, it transitively added the include search path and the library search path for us to get a, appropriate inclusion of Wix widgets header files and linking against Wix, Wix widgets libraries. We're not going to link against anything yet. Our first job is just to make sure that when we include these headers, that stuff doesn't blow up. And in my case, I ran into problems with, uh, because um, in the Windows SDK headers, in order to support both ANSI and Unicode builds, a function that has ANSI and Unicode variants, the name of the function will actually be pound defined to either the wide character string variant or the narrow character string variant, the wide character string variant will be the name of the API call suffixed with a W and the narrow string version will be suffixed with an A for ANSI. However, because the preprocessor is evil, it means that any use of that token anywhere in the code is going to have its macro substitution applied. So there's a couple of places in Wix widgets itself where they use um, the same token but uh, due to the pound define it's not it, it doesn't end up getting uh, directed to the right uh, member call uh, I'm sorry I misspoke it's not Wix widgets it's MFC MFC has member functions that parallel the names of the win32 API functions so when you include the um, Wix widgets header it ends up being such a way that um, Wix widgets doesn't like the way Windows uh, you know redirects the token to the W suffix or the A suffix so the Wix widgets headers may undefine that macro and then you have a problem that you're trying to call a member function on an MFC class that depended on the macro expanding to either the W suffix or the A suffix and now you have an error because that macro has been undefined so in my case I only had a, a couple of uh, occurrences of this so um, if it occurs many times the simplest thing as you're just trying to move forward is just to remove the inclusion of WX.H and, and deal with it later but if it's only a couple of places then what you can do is add some conditional um, you know, if def Unicode call the W function explicitly or call the in the else branch call the A function explicitly that's what I did in my code, we'll see that after you've got it um, the, the initial attempt was to add the Wix widgets header to your source file the reason we try it in the source file first is because that way the changes are isolated to one single file if we added it to a header, then anybody that included that header is going to have a problem. So we fix the problems in source files one at a time. 
having fixed all the source files, then we can add wx.h to header files, and that should still compile clean because we fixed the problems in all the source files one at a time. Again, remember the philosophy here is make small changes, keep everything building, keep everything working, and not get overwhelmed with too many compile errors at once. So that's why we first added it to the source file, and we did it as the last included header uh, so that uh, it, the chances of Wix widgets defining something that's going to mess up one of our headers is now eliminated because the Wix widgets header gets included last. The only thing it's going to affect from then on is the source code in our source file. Once we've addressed all those issues, we can move it from the source file to the header file, but again, keep it as the last included header. Uh, get that highlighted. Keep that as the last included header so that it's not interfering with any other headers in, in terms of like whatever it might be doing with the preprocessor. This would all be simpler if everything was using C++ 20 modules, but we're talking 15 year old code here, so it's going to use the preprocessor. It's going to use header files. Now that we've got wx.h visible everywhere, we can start switching uh, the string handling and the string handling, um, it's going to turn out that even though we're going to do things like take a WX string and pass it to some MFC function, the uh, implicit conversion operators defined for WX string are going to normally do the right thing. It's going to implicitly convert to a wide character string pointer or even a narrow character string pointer, as the case may be, uh, due to some, you know, a little bit of trickery that WX string does. but Basically, you want to start getting all the string handling converted over to use WX string. Uh, there's some uh, little bit of a gotcha. C string has format as an instance member function, but WX string has format as a static function that returns. So, so C string format in MFC, it has a return value, but you don't have to use it. If you don't, it, it's going to operate on the instance on which you called format. So you say, you know, foo.format, blah, 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 and then the instance foo of C string will be changed. In WX string, it's a static member function. So although you can invoke it through instance member syntax, if you have clang tidy and, and clang checks turned on, it'll alert you that you're trying to call a static function through a member syntax. But if you don't have that, what's just going to end up happening is it won't take the result of the format and store it in the instance through which you invoked format because format always returns the formatted string as the return value of this function. So you have to just be watching out for that. That's covered in the wiki page guide to porting to, MF, uh, porting to Wix widgets from MFC. Um, I bumped into... I had uses in this code of delete at an index and that deletes a single character but and you might think you want to switch that to WX string remove but that does something different and remove in Wix string takes an index and removes every character from that index to the end so uh, that was giving me a hard time I just switched it to remove not looking at the Reference documentation in detail got me into a little bit of trouble. Um, there's also just differences in how strings can be trimmed. Um, you'll find in WX string that they have brought in a lot of the member functions from std string and they're named the same. So this fine underscore first underscore not underscore of on a WX string does exactly the same thing as what you're used to using std string. So You've got some ability to just quickly implement the necessary string manipulation using uh, member functions that are the same semantics, but on WX string as they are the same same semantics as std string, but instead of being on std string, they're on WX string. Um, so once you complete that step, you'll have an MFC program. 
but it's using WX string for all your application storage for member function storage um, and you can uh, interoperate with MFC functions through the implicit conversions to either a constant T string or a modifiable T string and once you've done that if you have a class that's only using MFC headers just to get access to C string then you can drop the inclusion of the MFC header because now we've got WX stream from WX.H. Now, in uh, it turns out, Wix widgets also supplies this underscore T macro. Let's take a let's just take a look at some code here so we can see kind of what we're talking about. So there's a big pile of code here off in the main of this. If we look at our use of WXT, so these macros around string literals what are they doing well in a unicode build they turn that into a string prefixed with the uh, I forget what they call that in the grammar in C++ but this this is a, a wide character string literal this is a string literal it's like a literal prefix or something like that but this turns into uh, W care T's the individual characters are W care T's if I drop the L prefix off then it's an array of cares and so the whole point of this either underscore T and MFC if we look at what what does underscore T do in a uh, Oh, it looks like it delegates to double underscore T. Double underscore T and a Unicode build turns into the L prefix pasted with whatever the argument is. So this turns into a single token. That's the, the double pound sign is the token pasting operator of this preprocessor. And if we look inside this file, we'll see here's the, it's turned off because I'm building for Unicode. You can see here's the pound else. Unicode. So in an ANSI build, it just turned the macro just turns into its argument. It turns out up here when we were converting to Unicode, I was saying use the uh, T care. Uh, I didn't. Oh, I should probably edit that to use W under, underscore T there. Um, turns out Wix widgets also has underscore T. So if you were using underscore T. You could have just kept it that way. To make it clear that I'm switching to Wix widgets, I've switched them to WXT. They're WXT and underscore T and Wix widgets are the same. Um, so it's a kind of kind of a common thing between MFC and Wix widgets to use underscore T. But I like to be more explicit and switch things to WXT. Um, let's go back here to the list. So we're switching all the string stuff over. You're going to have to uh, look out for those T string, uh, C style string manipulation functions. They're not going to be available in Unicode builds on Linux or on Mac OS. That's a Windows only thing like TCS copy turning into WCS copy. So, what you want to do is replace those with some kind of string algorithm using the WX string. And I had done that in a couple places where I had little algorithms and the best thing to do was to just pull them out into a helper function that's just doing pure string manipulation. It's not interacting with GUI in any way. Something like this, which, you know, I'm pulling out, there's an a, a error message from the assembler and I'm pulling out the line number of the error message from that text. It's just a pure string algorithm. I can implement it purely using WX string. And after having pulled that out, I can write some covering tests for the different aspects of that algorithm to make sure that it is working as expected and that I didn't break it. And then I can, in my GUI code, if we go to find usages on this, show you here's a place where I'm using that you know inside this left button double click event handler I'm just calling that function on the text that came out of um, I got 
range on the selection and then I got a line number corresponding to that range uh, the beginning of the range and then I pulled out a line of text from the GUI control and then I used my little utility function here to get the line number and if the line number was parsed as valid meaning a, a, a a, a zero or positive value I can tell the editor window we need to go jump to that line so let's go back to our list here after you get all the string stuff converted over if your application does quite a bit of string processing this is you know a simulator it has text windows with um, memory contents has hex values and it's got an assembler that's going to produce you know error output and stuff so there's quite a bit of you know text farbling going on here so it was quite a bit of work just to convert all the text stuff over to use wx string uh, the next thing you might run into is logging and assertions um, mfc has a assert macro you want to switch those to use the assert macro from wix widgets uh, uses of trace you want to switch that to wx log debug make sure you use wx log debug and not wx log to make sure you get the corresponding functionality if we look around here i've got usages of that you know here's a simple usage of it with just a a constant a string literal here's some error messages here's where I am doing a string format and printing out some stuff uh, here's another case where I'm printing out a for, an a formatted error message that I got from Windows so um, that was previously using trace in MFC I want to use WX log debug and the idea here is incrementally we want to get every MFC related thing and every Windows specific related thing migrated out of our code into something that's portable. Next thing you're probably going to run into is file handling. I had some usages of C standard IO file. Um, mem file is, is basically a file abstraction around a chunk of memory. Um, it's also possible you could switch to using the file streams from the standard library both MFC and Wix widgets as frameworks predate the standard library so they in, they introduced their own file mechanisms file operating classes because they couldn't depend on IF stream OF stream I stream O stream uh, string streams and so on they couldn't depend on those from the standard library because the standard library hadn't yet been standardized the first C++ standard came out in 1998 and both these libraries predate the standardization of C++ so they had their own mechanisms um, whether you switch to you know WX file variants or whether you switch to um, standard streams it doesn't really matter it's just whatever is easiest for you um, there's also um, there's a, there's a class here. It's kind of just it only differs by one letter. I'm not a fan of class names that differ only by one letter, but WXF file is a class that uh, Wix widgets uses to wrap a C file pointer, so all caps file star and WX file is a wrapper class that wraps a file descriptor so an integer file descriptor like you would get from the POSIX open call people don't really do file descriptor stuff in MFC they either use file star or they use um, C standard IO file it, it's just it, in my experience which I'm not saying I'm like a super MFC expert, but I have seen MFC apps over the years. Uh, stuff that's using file descriptors tends to be more coming from, you know, uh, Unix land where people use POSIX functions to manipulate file descriptors a lot. Um, so after you switched over strings, logging, assertions, files, now we can start moving on to user interface elements and the standard thing. The, the, the simplest thing to switch over first is usage of message box or the standard file browse dialog so message box is just a, a, a raw Windows function um, there's a corresponding 
Wix widgets function, WX message box. Uh, if you've got message beep, which just plays a sound to indicate, you know, some usually to indicate some kind of error. Uh, in message beep in Windows, you can give it a number, and it's used to play different sounds depending on which number you give it. In um, Wix widgets, there's just WX bell, so that you don't get to play different sounds. As, uh, uh, portable sound processing is a whole different uh, can of worms. So in, in Wix widgets, there's just WX bell. There might not be any audio output at all, and in, in which case WX bell, I believe, will flash the screen to indicate uh, some kind of attention is needed. Uh, see file dialog, standard file browse dialog used for opening files, for saving files. Uh, the corresponding functionality is, comes from WX file dialog in Wix widgets. Um, there's this idea of user settings uh, in MFC. Usually there's uh, using the registry. Really old applications in MFC might be using like an INI file to save user settings. This is usually just uh, for a GUI application, it's usually just from the file menu, the most recently 10 used files, you know, that you went through file open or whatnot. Um, there's WX file history in Wix widgets to manage the most recently used file list. Um, set registry key in MFC is used to specify the name of the key under which all the application settings will be stored in the registry. WX config is a user settings uh, configuration mechanism in Wix widgets, and it also can take a name under which to group all the settings for this application. In Windows, it will use the registry, and in Linux, it will use uh, a little text file that it can serialize all the settings out to that text file and then deserialize them to read back the last stored settings. Um, and now it starts getting more interesting. Um, there's the application class, and I haven't uh, let's I haven't yet shown you what this application looks like. So let's run it. I'm going to show you that real quick, and I'll I'll show you what I've got migrated so far. I haven't migrated the entire application yet. Okay, so. Here's the main window. It's got some <coughs> excuse me. It's got some toolbars uh, with images on there, uh, and this is like run and uh, step into, step out, step over. You know, for executing code in this simulated microprocessor. Here's the little keypad with the uh, input buttons. You can see that they give a little visual indicator when I click on them. And then here's the LED display. You're not seeing anything uh, active in there right now because the, the simulator isn't executing, it's not simulating any code. Um, this window here is a disassembly view of memory. And uh, we can see down here, here's some, you know, FFFF turns into store X in location FFFF. Um, and uh, there might be a little bit of code down here. This thumb scroller is not the best for navigating huge amounts of memory. Um, and then this is just a, a memory view down here. And again, I mentioned this is an MDI style application. So we have these multiple document interface child windows inside our main window. And if I use the maximize button here, it just takes up the whole space of the application. This is the view of the CPU registers. Um, and then down here, I believe this is uh, like a trace output. There's no documentation for this program, so I kind of have to guess what's what. We can create a new assembly file. And down here is a window that will display errors from the assembler. So if we just start typing in some uh, assembly code here and my origin is going to be at, at 8,000 hex and I'm going to load the A accumulator well, it's supposed to be load AA with 1F immediate and then store AA in location 10 
I can save that. Uh, just save out here as temp ASM. We'll overwrite that file. So now it's this little assembly window is attached to this file, temp.asm, and I can go over here to edit, and I can say go ahead and compile that. And the assembler is kind of goofy. Uh, I think it is just buggy. It, it, it should not have any problem with this. It's perfectly valid, but it got an error. It doesn't. It doesn't like some stuff here, um, and it's displaying these errors down in this window. This is a window. This window showing the build errors is a Wix widgets control. This text editing region up here is an MFC control, and they're all. They're both inside an MFC MDI MDI child frame, and then that's all inside an MFC top-level window. And this thing over here is completely MFC, except I've loaded the image for this little keypad using Wix widgets. So I've managed to get my application along the way ported. I've got some controls coming from Wix widgets. I've got some um, resource manipulation using Wix widgets. I've got the rest of it in MFC as it was originally, bugs and all. And uh, if I close this application, all the windows get closed and some memory leaks get reported, but you know, it's probably just buggy application code. So let's take a look at how we've got, because uh, the next thing on our agenda here is you know, start migrating the main application class. Uh, you, you, these um, subsequent steps after after we've got you know all the basics taken care of, they can kind of be done in different order because you can have an MFC top level application hosting. Uh, sorry, you can have a top level Wix widgets application creating MFC top level frames holding MFC controls or you can have an MFC application creating top-level Wix widgets frames. That WX MFC sample demonstrates how to do both. There's a little, uh, this sample, WX MFC, there's a little compile time flag that will do it one way or the other. Um, at the moment, I left my main application class as an MFC class but I've derived from this WX MFC win app that acts as a shim that lets me host Wix widgets controls in an MFC application. I will show you that. So over here in my main is where the main app is declared and you can see I'm deriving from this WX MFC win app which is a type def uh, C win app is the MFC application class and this little wrapper guy he just has some stuff in the init instance which is MFC's way of getting the application started it gets Wix widgets started and does some uh, Wix widgets related teardown and there's a little bit of jiggery pokery here with the event loop to get Wix widgets events processed on the Wix widgets event loop so that a Wix widgets control sees events delivered to it from Wix widgets and an MFC control will see events delivered to it from MFC so we kind of have like two event loops running simultaneously and the way to get them uh, hooked in is that uses this pre-translate message which is a method it can override on the MFC app class and a little bit of uh, idle processing here to get the the uh, idle processing events sent to a Wix widgets control as well as sent to an MFC control and the reason that you need to send idle events to both uh, stack of controls is because uh, in these GUI frameworks idle events is where they do certain processing that um, they don't want to have running continuously, so they wait until the user stops generating events. You know, they're, stop, they're not moving the mouse, they're not typing on the keyboard, and it kind of catches up on its um, control processing in the, in the idle phase. Um, so, 
we've got our application class switched over to use WXMFC WinApp so that we can get both Wix widgets event processing going on and we can get MFC event processing going on. Uh, you can see I've also got a little bit of additional Wix widgets initialization here to, to add an image handler to handle PNG images and initialize the resource mechanism. We'll take a look at that in a little bit. Um, so as you do this stage, now you've got support for creating Wix widgets controls inside an MFC window. So you can start migrating your controls over from whatever the MFC control class mechanism is over to a Wix widgets control. So let's take a look at that. In the assembly editor window, which is what we were looking at, let's take a look at the class declaration. So this is an MFC MDI child window. I've also had uh, an abstract interface that I want this editor window to implement. The abstract interface methods are down here. This is just an abstraction around my editor window. The editor window can either show or hide the build window. Uh, there's a functionality to jump to a particular line in the uh, assembly source code and I, I may need to display I, I may need to have a beep issued on an error so if I got a, a build error I may need to have a beep those methods are implemented down here uh, well they're declared down here and we'll see the implementation in a second this is the basic stuff that I had from MFC before so I've got application related functions I've got event handlers for events that are dispatched to this control by MFC I've got a message map declared which is the mechanism that does the uh, message dispatching I've got some uh, private methods and I've got private data down here now when in MFC when you create an instance of this ASM editor window it's going to create the child controls inside this MDI child so it's got the MDI frame as its parent it's going to create controls and you notice that the last argument here is the parent this is just standard MFC stuff uh, you'll notice I'm using WXT for the string literals um, so this is creating the MDI child window I'm calling create on my parent class so if we go remind ourselves here that this editor window derives from MDI child window so I'm going to call my parent, my super class create method to get the MDI child created then I'm going to create my controls inside so I've got the text editor this is an MFC uh, well I've, it's as I'm edit but it's really just a rich edit control they, I, in MFC you derive from existing controls in order to provide the customized event handlers there's a lot of different ways you can do event handling in both Wix widgets and MFC but that is one very common idiom so create the child control for the rich text editor that's going to hold the assembly source code. I'm next going to create a Wix widgets control. Now a Wix widgets control has to be hosted in a Wix widgets hierarchy. I've got a, this build edit control that I've written the which overrides or derives from WX text control which is a Wix widgets control. I'm doing that so I can again override some event handling but in order to create a Wix widgets control the parent of a Wix widgets control has to be some other Wix widgets control if I, I can't supply null pointer here because only top level windows can have no parent so this thing this WX native container window 
This is a thing that takes a native Windows handle. I, so it, it's a native handle to a Windows Win32 window. It's kind of awkward to talk about some of these things because Windows is both the name of the toolkit and there's a thing called a window. Uh, th this thing, it is an HWIN, so it's a handle to a Win32 window. Using this guy, I can take the handle of the Win32 window that corresponds to my MDI child parent, wrap it up in a WX native container window. This gives me a thing that looks like a Wix widgets control that I can use as my parent for creating my child Wix widgets control. That's how I'm able to mix a Wix widgets control hosted inside an MFC control. The MFC control is a customized version of MDI child window and using this little intermediate wrapper I can create my guy on there. Now you might notice that my member variable here was created on the heap. I found out the hard way that these Wix widgets controls have to be created on the heap. Otherwise, when we close these windows and tear them down, you'll get a, a, an attempt to delete some memory that wasn't allocated on the heap. Because Wix widgets assumes everything was created on the heap and it can delete them when things are torn down. So if this was, if my member here was not a pointer, but was an instance like that, I would get a weird memory error, which I which I did. I initially had it as just a plain instance and not as a pointer. So I'm creating it on the heap. Uh, you might ask, why am I passing this in there? And that's because I'm using that to couple my build edit control to an abstraction representing my assembler editor window. And in my event handlers for my build edit control when I need to communicate back to the editor window I'm going to use that abstraction this is mediator pattern instead of connecting the two controls directly to each other now that one control is in Wix widgets and one control is in MFC connecting them to each other directly that can be tricky so instead of doing that instead of trying to send an MFC message from a Wix widgets control, I connect myself to an abstraction. The abstraction does the MFC junk inside the MDI child that I've created. So that's why I've got these methods here. They exist as an abstraction represented by this pure virtual interface. It's an abstraction that allows my Wix widgets control to communicate with the editor window, the assembly editor window, without having to be connected directly to MFC. So back here in my, let's go back a little bit more, in the event handlers for my Wix widgets control when I need to communicate back uh, it turns out the communication is all one direction it's all from the build edit control back to the assembly editor window so that I don't have any queries I just have actions or commands rather command query separation I just have commands I'm sending commands to the editor window to tell it what to do in response to the events that were delivered to the build edit control and by decoupling myself from MFC, now these are just, they're just plain method calls. They, I, can, I can send it, this jump to line one is probably the most uh, useful to look at because I figured out from the error message in the, in the build output that was written into this build edit control. I figured out the line number. I need to tell the editor window, go to that line number. So I'm, I don't know anything about MFC here, how to navigate 
crazy MFC things to get to a particular line number, I just say, hey, editor window, go to that line number. If we go look at the implementation of that, we see that, you know, there's just like a bunch of crazy stuff that we have to do inside here in MFC just to get the right line number displayed. Now, if when this code was originally written and it was sending MFC messages from one control to another, instead of this being something straightforward like taking an integer line, it looks more like this. It's got a W param and an L param and we have to decode the the real information we are after from the W param and the L param and then we can call that jump to line. Uh, when you write an MFC message dispatching mechanism, a lot of times the signature of the event handler is, you know, it, it, it corresponds to these historical WPRAM, LPRAM mechanisms of sending messages through the Windows message pump. And so it's, just, it, it's not very useful from an application perspective. You end up having to constantly marshal in and out of these WPRAM, LPRAM things. So it's better, in my opinion, to use this abstract interface as a way to connect my Wix widgets control to this window. And that way the Wix widgets control doesn't need to know anything about these crazy MFC messages and the way that they're packed. So, that's an example of how to get the controls migrated. Um, it, it's just lather, rinse, repeat as you go through all your controls and then finally get your top level frames migrated. Once all your top level frames are migrated, you can then take your application class and disconnect it from MFC and just have it be a pure Wix widgets application class. And after you've migrated, whatever all this other junk that you have, you know, strings, file handling, you may interact with other operating system services that are specific to Windows, you may have to create abstractions for those. Uh, that's discussed down here in this remaining Windows dependencies, but at least in terms of the GUI, if, if you don't have any, if it's just straight GUI code, once you've migrated all the controls, and you've migrated all the top level window frames, you've decoupled your application class from MFC, you can finally remove this CMake MFC flag from your CMake base build. And you should be only depending on Wix widgets classes at that point. And you should have an application that's purely with a cross platform GUI using only Wix widgets. Then you can turn on a Linux build. It'll probably break. Because you'll probably have a few things GCC didn't like that MSVC was fine with or you have a few little things that are still connecting you to Windows and you didn't realize it you'll take those errors you'll go back up here um, and you have to figure out some cross-platform way to deal with that uh, mechanism for instance in this code I haven't abstracted it away yet but this code is using create process to invoke the assembler on the file that you were editing in the assembler view it invokes the assembler on that assembly source code file, snatches the output from the assembler using a pipe, and then takes the output from that pipe and writes it into the build error window, which we migrated to Wix widgets. So create process, that's a, that's a Windows thing. In order to port that over to Linux, I'm gonna have to do something else, probably use uh, uh, POSIX spawn, I believe is the API call. Yes, POSIX spawn. But even if you only plan to ship on Windows, I would recommend getting your code building on Linux because you will um, find things with GCC that you won't find with MSVC and vice versa. Each compiler has their strengths at problems they're able to detect and warn you about. So getting your code compiling on, and if you can manage it, on GCC, on Clang, and on MSVC will give you um, 
the best way to alert yourself of subtle problems hiding in your code. Now, one thing that we haven't discussed that comes up in a GUI application is the loading of resources. And we saw when we ran this code that the keypad device had a little window that it displayed. We take a look at the source code for that. So, to do it the MFC way, I had a resource script with an identifier. This is just a number. It's a, it's a pound define in a header file that gets included by the resource compiler on Windows. So, this, this number 1000 is just arbitrary. But it identifies this particular resource in my resource script and if I'm if I'm lucky okay so there's the resource identifier in Visual Studio when you double click on an RC file it knows to bring up the resource view so it's showing me here inside keypad I have this resource script inside here and there's a bitmap in there and if I double click that it's gonna show me a big view and uh, I guess I can't uh, change that I can't I'm stuck with that I can move this one so there's the an expanded view and the the uh, one-to-one -one view of this bitmap so it's a it's a BMP file close this resource view since we don't need that anymore this uh, BMP file here you know, Visual Studio now shows it ridiculously huge. But if we want to load that cross platform, A, we probably don't want to use BMP image file format because that's Windows specific and there are better formats for such images these days. PNG is a is a better one. And if we take a look over here if we go into the keypad folder, I don't know if you can see that, but the key, the PNG is 4K and the BMP is 94K. So a, a PNG file is a much more compact representation of the same data. So to load that bitmap MFC style, we're going to call load image on a module and load image understands that there's this compiled resource inside the executable image on Windows. It will go and find that little chunk of blob data in the uh, corresponding module. In my case, the module I got from by calling get module handle. This is this is all Windows specific, so this code is going to have to change at some point. But for now, that's what we're doing. So this is getting the module corresponding to the shared object that represents this plugin. So that's the module handle for this DLL. Uh, I can get the full path corresponding to that module so that I can um, get access to it using WX file name class just to do some file manipulation. Because we're going to show you several different ways of doing that. But the MFC way, it just needs the module handle and then you call load image you tell it you want to load uh, a, a bitmap and it gives you a handle to a bitmap so this HBMP here is a handle a generic Win32 resource handle and then in MFC I'm gonna take that bitmap handle I'm going to attach it to a C bitmap object it's an MFC object that is a wrapper around a bitmap handle that gives you uh, methods for doing things with that bitmap. We, we see, if we take a look here, the main thing that it's used is to select that bitmap into a Windows GDI drawing context, a DC. 
and that's how you can copy an image onto the screen. You select a bitmap handle into the DC and then you call the bitblit method on the device context. This idea of a device context that you use to draw onto the screen. There's a similar thing in Wix widgets, a WXDC. This code hasn't been converted yet. It's still doing everything the, the MFC way. Oops, that's not we want where we wanted to go. Uh, I can't, oh, it wants, it's got that in my view stack now and we're stuck there. So let's go back over this way. Uh, let's go f look for this attach. Okay, so this M underscore BMP, it, it's just a MFC resource managing wrapper class that manages the handle to a bitmap. When you destroy the MBMP, the bitmap will be freed. The, the bitmap is a handle to a, to a chunk of data in memory, so we need to free that up. Now, the Wix widgets way, Wix widgets doesn't have this Windows resource stuff. What it does have is I can, I have, I have a couple different ways of shipping these resources with my application. I can ship them as side-by-side uh, -side files. So this uh, load method enum thing here is just a way for me to quickly switch between the three different ways of loading stuff. Um, I can take the path to my module the directory containing my module and I, my shared library and I can look for a file called keypad PNG in that same directory so this is just their file name uh, convenience class for manipulating directories and files when you construct one the first argument is a directory and the second argument is a file within that directory and it understands, you know, that it uses backslash path separator on Windows and uses slash path separator on Unix and so on. So it, it, it's better when you're manipulating uh, paths and files to use this uh, WX file name class as a helper to get all that stuff sorted out. So on a WX image object, so this keypad is a WX image. I can call load file and give it a path and it will read the corresponding image file format for which it has a decoder and then turn that into an in-memory representation of a rectangle of pixels that are filled with colors. So an image just it's just a rectangle of pixels it's not yet something that we can draw on the screen but a WX image can be implicitly converted to a WX bitmap. A WX bitmap is something that we can draw on the screen. And in fact, what I can do is I can get the resource handle, the platform specific resource handle from a WX bitmap. And then I can assign that to this H bitmap, which then the MFC bitmap wrapper will be attached. So here I'm reading the image from a file. I'm converting that uh, to a bitmap, a WX bitmap from a WX image. And then I'm getting the underlying resource handle. Now you may, if you've got eagle eyes, you may have noticed this WX image was created here on the stack. This WX bitmap is held as a member variable. And the reason is we need to keep this WX bitmap alive for as long as we're using it in, in uh, this WX bitmap cars is the Wix widgets thing that corresponds to this C bitmap when the WX bitmap is destroyed it will destroy the underlying platform specific image representation for the bitmap and the handle which we grabbed out will no longer be valid once it's destroyed so if my WX bitmap was on the stack here I would get a handle to a bitmap that was destroyed by the time I tried to use it, and that wouldn't work. The So this is the side-by-side -side, uh, file method. Uh, uh, the final method, uh, uh, well, this, you know, is just 
getting stuff out of the file system and then I have to make sure that I got these image files and I have to package them up in my installer and so on. What if I just want to have everything just in the executable just like Windows does it? Well, Wix Widgets has this thing called an XML resource um, system and you write an XML script that represents whatever resources you want to reference using this system. You take this XML script, you compile it with the uh, WXRC tool that comes with Wix widgets. It takes this XML file and it can do a couple of different uh, kinds of output. One, it, it can create a compiled resource version. Similar in Windows it's a .res file, that's the output of the resource compiler. In Wix widgets an XRC file is compiled to an XRS file, that's the compiled resource version. It's basically a zip file. Wix widgets has this concept of virtual file systems so it can access the contents of a zip file from a URI that just references the zip file and the name of the nested file within the zip. Or you can run WXRC and say generate the binary blob and then output a C++ source file that holds the binary blob as just a big byte array. So I've chosen that latter style for the embedded resource. So I, I'm, in, I'm embedding it manually essentially what's doing. This resources.cpp is the file that was generated by WXRC. It includes some uh, infrastructure stuff. And then here's the raw bytes, unsigned cares, that represent the data coming from my 4K PNG file and whatever extra metadata um, is needed. I believe this is just the four, this part here is probably just the 4K representing, oh yeah, see, here it is. 4457. This is my PNG file as a array of bytes. And then down here, this is my XML stuff as another array of bytes. And it generates this little function. You can, through command line arguments, you can change the name of that little function if you don't like init XML resource. You want it to be something else. Maybe you've got multiple of these resource files generated for a single executable. So each one has to have a distinct function name. In this case, we're just using the default. And you can see here, it's, here's a memory file system handler. It's creating a virtual file system. It's opening up that file by name from the memory file system to which we've added a file. Then we're opening up the file that we added. Uh, I don't know why it does the remove here, um, but it's... I think this is just bootstrapping stuff to get the uh, memory file system set up. At any rate, um, our two little data blobs get added. One is an image slash PNG type, and the other one is text slash XML uh, meme type. And then we're going to uh, instantiate the resource XML resource system to get an instance to the singleton. And then we're going to load this resource, which it has a big long verbose name to make it unique so that we have a bunch of resources embedded they all have distinct names and they're not going to clash with each other in my main application I added the PNG image decoder handler to the um, image framework uh, you can add arbitrary handlers for any kind of image format you need to deal with um, there's a bunch of ones that ship with Wix widgets PNG is the one where we we'll, we could add all of them but I'm just adding the PNG one because that's the only one we need and then initialize all the handlers for XML resources so that in keypad sorry keypad keypad CPP we get the XML resource instance and we call load bitmap and we say we want to load the thing that is named keypad underscore png that keypad underscore png 
is the name that I chose in my resource script to refer to that PNG file that it slurped in when I ran WXRC. Having loaded that into a WX bitmap object, if we look at the XML, oops, let's go back look at the XML. It was a resource, there's a resource, and then there's a WX bitmap object. Uh, this is just the top level XML tag for WXRC resources. Oh, let's go back over here. So I've loaded that bitmap from the name keypad underscore PNG, which is what I called it in my XML. Having stored that into a WX bitmap, I can now get the Windows resource handle out of that for MFC to use to attach to a C bitmap object that's later used in a MFC device context for drawing. Now, one interesting thing about Wix widgets resource scripts compared to a Windows resource script. In a Windows resource script, you can only lay out uh, controls that are children of a dialogue. So a top level window that is not a dialogue, like an MDI child frame and so on, or an MDI parent frame, in MFC, those child controls of those top level frames have to be added manually through code. They can't be loaded from a resource script. A resource script can only contain dialogue definitions in terms of parent-child control relationships. Uh, the other kinds of things a Windows resource script can contain are things like icons and strings and bitmaps. But in terms of a parent-child control relationship, it's only dialogues. In Wix widgets, that is not the case, that you're, you're not restricted to only dialogues. You can specify child, uh, parent-child control relationships between any control that Wix widgets can instantiate. And if you have custom controls, you can extend the resource mechanism to recognize your custom controls so that when you load them from a Wix widgets resource script, it will know to invoke the constructors for your custom controls and not just the stock controls that are represented by Wix widgets it, that ship with the base Wix, Wix widgets library. And this means that your entire user interface can be specified declaratively in a resource script and then your application code just loads that UI description and wires up uh, the event callbacks to the appropriate controls by referencing them by name. And in Wix widgets land, there's a variety of both commercial and open source uh, dialogue editors, user interface editors, where you construct the whole uh, user interface interactively and then tell it to spit out an XRC file that you then use to instantiate your user interface. If you've ever done any Windows Forms programming in C Sharp, it's very similar concept. You have a, you know some kind of GUI designer. You're dragging controls onto a window, positioning them, setting their properties, um, one of which will be their name that you use to fetch it via code. And uh, having set all those properties and things, you can set everything up visually so you don't have to programmatically you know, iterate on fonts and position of the controls within a window and you know how much space should be between the control and its neighbors and how much space should be allowed around the label inside a button and all that all that kind of stuff that's basically all those visual properties you can set them visually save out an XRC file and then compile that XRC file into a resource description that you can then uh, load the controls programmatically by their names, including you top level, you just load a top level window and it'll instantiate everything inside the top level window. Um, for C++ applications with MFC on Windows, you only have that luxury when you're designing dialogues and it's still a little bit clunky. It's, it, it's not as smooth as how I just described it for 
a Wix Widgets resource script. And, it, and it's definitely not as smooth as it was uh, with Windows Forms and C Sharp. Or even Visual Basic. Uh, VB6 became, Visual Basic 6 became extremely popular because there was a rich set of controls that you could use on a Visual Form designer. Uh, whether they were native controls or ActiveX controls, it didn't matter. And uh, just you know, double clicking on the controls took you to a code editor where you're writing the event handler, just like in the Windows Forms Designer. Uh, so Wix Widgets has that advantage over MFC. Um, now, if you got all your controls converted and you got all your top level frames converted and you got your application class converted and you made the final removal of MFC you should be left with a portable build that works across platforms and maintains all the GUI logic you probably will run into a few nagging Windows dependencies that you didn't realize you had um, if you're lucky Wix widgets out of the box will offer some kind of class that supports that same functionality. Wix widgets has networking classes, for instance, that expose sockets as streams. So you can just read data off a stream to read data off a networking con network connection. Um, there's also a bunch of user contributed controls and extensions to Wix widgets that you can use, both open source and closed source, that provide additional functionality. In the end, if you still don't have what you need, you can write your own Wix widget style class that does the corresponding platform specific thing depending on whether you're building it for Windows or whether you're building it for Linux or Mac OS. Um, this whole process, while straightforward in the abstract, is a lot of work. As you can see, this application isn't that particularly complicated, and I've been working on it for a couple of days here, and having gotten, you know, all the string and logging and file handling and all, gotten all that stuff converted, I only got as far as like one control migrated over to Wix widgets. However, the advantage of this approach is I kept a working application every step of the way. I never was stuck for you know two weeks where my code barely compiled much less ran and that is the way that I recommend you always do these big changes do them incrementally in a way that you always have a working system you can always go back and test it you haven't broken anything you can always commit to master and you know should some emergency arise where you have to go spend two weeks doing something else you didn't end up in a situation where your code's all busted and and now nobody can do anything with that code because it's it's all halfway broken so keep your changes small and focused uh, always keep a working system backfill in unit tests if you have to, uh, to in order to make sure that you didn't break anything do a little bit of refactoring and decoupling along the way use mediator pattern if you if you hadn't done that before for complex user interface controls, if it's just, just a simple dialogue with an input text box, you know, just, just convert it. Don't worry about doing mediator on that. It's going to be, you know, probably not worth the effort unless you just want to do it as a learning exercise. But if you've got, you know, 15, 16 controls on an elaborate top level window and there's a lot of interactions between the controls, things disabling and enabling other controls based on certain conditions, things you know, you click one button and certain text gets added to another control. It's probably something worth uh, creating a mediator pattern and unit testing it as it exists in MFC before you start converting it to Wix widgets. Uh, Why? That was a lot of talking. Uh, I thought this one was going <laughs> to go faster than last month where we talked for two hours, but here we are. Uh, it's a complicated process. Um, I will, in the YouTube video, I will include a link to this gist that I have that's describing this whole set of steps. So you can have that around. I, I, will, I will not delete that. Just keep that as public. And hopefully that will get you on your way with 
a working system the whole time instead of a big busted mess that you got to figure out later.